Brick and mortar retailers are under attack. Publishers cutting margins. Distributors selling hot product on the gray market. E-commerce platforms allowing deep discounters more marketing push. Other retailers selling so cheap they must hate money. Customers selling out of their backpacks and wanting MSRP when the market price is above MSRP and wanting market price when the MSRP is higher than that. How am I going to survive this onslaught from outside forces? That's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome to Episode 2, Game Retail Ramblings. I'm your host, Travis Severance, live from Millennium Game Studios in slightly snowy Rochester, New York. I'd like to say thank you to everybody that tuned in for Episode 1 last week. I appreciate the likes, the comments, the shares, the Spotify downloads, all that stuff. Without you, I'm kind of talking to a void. So thank you for taking the time to do that. It's Valentine's Day, and I think there's nothing better to talk about on Valentine's Day than relationships. So every statement that I made with my, as they call in the biz, cold open is true. I've, I've dealt with, I've either seen people publish or write about those things, or I've experienced them myself. Each of those things are different things that can be frustrating. They can feel, they can feel like a violation as a as a retailer with regard to your relationship with those different entities whether that's the you know the publishing side of things or this interesting place selling above average costed goods in the collectible space on various different platforms and you know I, I see all the time that retailers commenting about the prices that other retailers are selling their goods and why would why would anybody want to sell products for this low, it doesn't make any sense, it doesn't work with my business model, so on and so forth. To, to clear up a lot of that, as far as my take goes on everybody else's business, as long as they're within the legal limits to do whatever they're going to do, I don't, I don't really have a real hot take as far as this person's a bad person or that person's a bad person or this is, this is terrible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start all of this with a caveat and say, run your business how you want to run your business. If you're successful doing it, that's that's great. Continue to do that thing regardless of whether I like it or somebody else likes it. The market's going to sort you out better than I will. Your customers will let you know, the other people that you have business relationships will let you know. You know, and there are times in the past when people have acted in in incorrect ways and they had their hands slapped or they just they kind of exited the market based on what their behavior was. So, on that note, with it being Valentine's Day and happy birthday to my niece, MJ, today's focus is going to be on publishers. And I'm going to talk about things that publishers do that I've been annoyed with, other retailers have been annoyed with, that there's confusion about lack of understanding, misalignment, things where we look at something and it, whatever the publisher happens to be doing, it, it, it's a against our best interests. So when we take a look at these different topics, there are things that I've experienced over the, you know, the past couple of decades of doing this thing where it's either been frustrating when it happens, I felt blindsided because of it. There isn't a lot of times an explanation to us why the changes are being made. And I don't, I guess you don't, you don't necessarily owe anybody an explanation for why you're doing the things that you're doing, except for, you know, if I came home or if I was in a personal relationship with somebody and things completely shifted or I made some some sweeping change or some some different decision about how I was going to act towards them or the way that I was going to behave, typically I would want to give some sort of an explanation or communicate. So a lot of times the the communication is really what the lacking is. So what happens is we, and I say we as, as, a, as a group of retailers because it's not just myself or my friends, end up trying to speculate. We swim around. We try to figure out why this is happening. I think the the initial reaction is, you know, we, we, we go here with the chicken little. The sky is falling down. This is some atrocity that has befallen us. How are we going to exist now? The other thing that I wanted to talk about, too, is we're going to cut at 30 minutes, and then anybody that asks questions in the stream chat I will get to those afterwards on Twitch. It won't be part of the YouTube video, so I'll spend you know maybe 10 minutes if people want to interact with me on the stream afterwards. So if you have some questions, feel free to pop them in the chat, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to try to unpack them as I, as I go. So I'm going to talk about seven, seven things that publishers do that some retailers hate, the caveat there being that some retailers hate it. Some of these things that I'm going to talk about 
aren't things necessarily that I personally care about, which is why I'm going to go sort of top down to talk about those things. And the other thing that I want to say to retail is a lot of times the reality of it is if I wasn't on social media and I was only paying attention to what was going on inside the walls of my store, and I know there's plenty of retailers out there where that's the case. They don't spend a lot of time on, on social media or interacting in that, in that capacity. I'd probably be a lot less angry, right? Like a lot of times I don't realize what I'm supposed to be angry about until somebody puts something in front of me that a publisher's done that seems unjust. And then there's this huge, you know, let's get some torches and pitchforks together and go after the big bad evil thing. A lot of times when I see that stuff, I end up evaluating it and determining the same way that I would with a personal relationship, does that impact or adjust my professional relationship with this specific publisher? And when I go through this list, I'm going to start out with two things that I don't care about. Number seven on my top seven things that publishers do that some retailers hate. Number seven is exclusive distribution. Some retailers get really frustrated or upset when a publisher decides that they're going to exclusively distribute through one channel. It doesn't bother me at all. There are any there are no distribution channels that I know of that, that charge me a fee to set up an account. It might be a little bit of a challenge because I've got to fill out some paperwork and I've got to send over some references. And if I have a complaint about that, it's most of the time the distributor's forms that they have for me are not digital and my handwriting is garbage. So that takes me a lot longer to try to do than it would if they just made the digital form and I could just submit that through with a signature box. Distribution, if you're listening, please do that on your forms and applications. You'll probably get more. But as far as exclusive distribution goes, I, I don't care. Sell through distribution, sell through sub distribution. There are sub distributors in our industry that are that are doing as good a job as regular distribution. They just have a smaller catalog and deal with smaller publishers. I think my only caveat on the exclusive distribution thing is my preference would be if you have a direct buying option for retail, it, it, that's nice. Typically, I tend to start with with smaller publishers, it, it's a direct relationship that ends up changing over time because I've, I've either discovered them at a convention or I've discovered them through crowdfunding. And for whatever reason, they've, they've come on my radar and I want to carry their stuff. So if you have a direct buying option and there's something where I can, you know, get the last 10 copies that you have that doesn't make sense because distribution only wanted 990 copies and you got another 10 on the shelf and they didn't sell at your convention and stuff like just give me an opportunity to be able to take that off your plate and then the other thing too that is helpful if you have a direct selling component built in is that you know during the holidays and a couple of different times a year i tend to buy some deep discounted items be able to sell them at a sale it helps you out because I'm trying to move your, your chaff. It helps me out because I've got a more robust sale for our customers here, and it's a win-win-win for everybody. And number six is crowdfunding. Plenty of retailers out there still to this day, although the, the numbers have gotten smaller, really don't like when publishers crowdfund. For me, it's just sort of part of our marketplace at this point. Kickstarter, GameFound, BackerKit, Indiegogo, I guess. They exist. They are... There are ways to bring your your games to a test bed market. A lot of times it will tell me specifically that this game matters to more people than I would have thought. The information that I get from your Kickstarter campaign is better than any sales sheet you're going to send me and outside of my own personal invested time to investigate your product and see if I think there, there's a space in the market for it. It gives me the best information that I could possibly have about your, mar your product before it hits the market. Now, do I sacrifice sales to local customers because of that? Maybe, probably, some small percentage, but it, whatever the amount of sales that's being taken out of my register because alpha board game publishers, role-playing publishers, TCG publishers are buying those things is minuscule compared to having the information that is available from your campaign, for better or worse. Some exceptions there, I'm going to pick on CMON a little bit, Masters of the Universe, Kickstarter reprint. I'm not a huge fan of that. I understand looking through the campaign that this is an opportunity to get some of the Kickstarter exclusive stuff sold to some of the areas that they couldn't sell to before. The game was put on my shelf less than a year ago. I've still got plenty of the core set. I've still got plenty of the box of power. I know that there's some small amount of stuff that's there that's available Speculation isn't really something that we do on this show. I will speculate a little bit that aside from selling into the other areas, 
I think this gives them an opportunity to possibly get outside of whatever the exclusive distribution rights are with Asmodee. I think crowdfunding, based on what I've seen in the market space and what's happened, I think crowdfunding kind of gets them around maybe some of the agreement that they have there. So this allows them to fund and to build up the revenue that they need to do another reprint if they don't necessarily have it in the can, which typically at this point their model is they've already got product or products on the way. When Queen Games was doing their Kickstarters and (laughs) everything that they were selling as add-ons were games in their catalog that were 40 to 50% off, I didn't enjoy that either. So there are times when I get annoyed with crowdfunding. If there's a retail tier or a direct option to buy off the platform, I have no issue with that. So that those are the two I don't care about. They don't they don't bother me. I had some caveats built into there, but in most cases they make sense. And even if you're outside of that caveat, 90% of the time, as long as I have a way to be able to get the game at some point to sell to my customers, that's all I care about. So things that I'm starting to care about. Number five is direct to consumers. So direct to consumer sales ticked up exponentially during COVID. I understand it. I get the reasoning. We we all did it, or I'm saying I did it. We we had a, you know, we dabbled in the e-commerce world by setting up a website, and the goal is this year to have everything in the store up on a website at some point. Some people care about publisher selling in conventions. That. That doesn't bother me. Selling directly to customers from your website, it's it ends up being a slippery slope. I I care less about it than some of the other stuff on this on this list. Um, I I guess my what I would hedge with is if everything was fair as far as you're selling direct to customers with regard to what you do and what I am allowed to do, then I have less of a problem. Stuff on your website. You're selling it at full MSRP. You're shipping out to the customers. No problem. I don't have an issue with that. Where things start to go afoul is when you use those things, whether they're conventions or whether they're exclusive buying opportunities on your e-commerce platform. So number four is run sales. So back in the day, Fantasy Flight used to do a huge holiday sale every year. And it was great because... Everything on their sale on their website was stuff that they were closing out. What it did for me was it helped me decide what inventory I wanted to shed. Sometimes there were products that were on their sale that I was really surprised about because they had sold well for me or they had sold better than average, I guess. So the fact that they showed up on the sale a lot of times was not a great sign because that meant there's no more expansions coming or... It's at the point where this they have they themselves may have overproduced. There was a number of different things that went that went on with that. And part of the problem with that sale back then was was it was deep discount stuff. It was you know seventy five percent off, give or take. So the first year that they ran it, I had a conversation with some of the people at Fantasy Flight, and I said, you know, this creates a really uneven playing field. I'm trying to sell your stuff. You're trying to sell your stuff. We're in the situation where. You know, I can't possibly reduce the stock I paid, you know, a flat margin for to the point where I can start to compete with you. So to their credit, what they did was when they decided that they were going to run sales moving forward, we could reach out to them and buy anything that they had that was available on their sale at normal margin below whatever the sale cost was. So if it was going to go up on their site at 75% off, we could buy it at 50% off of that 75% off as much as we wanted. They didn't care because like I said, a lot of times this was dead or overstock inventory. So they were just trying to get through it. It allowed us the opportunity to buy at a level that was commensurate with keeping things even as far as that goes. The other thing that I would say about sales is you're trying to balance your inventory the same way that I am, but you're also now trying to do it on an e-commerce platform that may or may not be profitable for you. You've gotten into the retail game. I understand that there's a benefit to having the emails that you get and an understanding of your customers and you get to play retailer a little bit there and you know get some understanding of what we deal with with regard to shipping and customer service and that sort of thing i am more concerned about what happens when the e-commerce platform has thousands of copies of a game that's really really hard to find and i can't get it direct from you 
and I can't get it direct from any of distribution, but there's plenty of it on your website. And I look silly to my customers because I don't have it and you have it. As far as, you know, different sales go, different things like that, a Valentine's Day sale, add, add any sale that you want to it. I run sales. Sales are a huge part of retail. Every industry outside of this one, for whatever reason, embraces sales. They use it. They understand it. It's a really, really important quiver or arrow to have in your quiver. When you run spot sales, WizKids run spot sales sometimes. I, I get it. You're flushing through that inventory, those decisions that you made, or you're trying to instigate some buying and things like that. From time to time, no problem. You're going to run a one-week sale and 20% off or buy one, get one or whatever. Do that thing. Just understand that when you're doing that thing, you're sort of in my world when it comes to that stuff. So just think about how long you want to run those sales. And one of the things that Renegade does a really good job with as an example, they run sales. They have closeouts on their website. Well, I can reach out to Scott and his team at any time. And they will give me pricing similar to what Fantasy Flight did for those closeout things so that I can sell those closeout things in my store at the same price as he's selling on his website. So when I use the word, and I'm going to use quotes on this, fair, if the sales ground, if the floor of everything is fair, then I don't feel like I'm at a loss and it doesn't do much to our relationship. Choosing to run a sale here and there or coupling it with something that makes sense or you know, combining a a core product with a new expansion and some kind of a small discount there to generate revenue. I, I don't care about that as much. I, I'd be willing to wager in most cases that, you know, I probably do a pretty good job with their sales of their products in my store. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to compare numbers to their, to their e-commerce at times and take a look. So that was five, which is direct to consumer sales. And then four running sales on your website or conventions, I see a lot of publishers will have closeouts at their conventions from time to time. That's amazing to me. I'm not sure if it's worth you carting that stuff across the country and paying drage to sit it on the convention floor to try to stimulate buying on lost product versus having a retail list and farming it out to us and just shipping and being done with it. But I, again, run your business how you want to. The optics of these things when I'm on the convention floor and when I'm looking at those things change my opinion of you as a publisher. So these last three things are things that will make me adjust my business relationship with your brand. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop selling your products necessarily. It means that all of the stuff that's built into my retail DNA that's used here to sell products better, what myself and my team have built inside of the store, the bells and the whistles that we add on to things to generate revenue and to really put a product or a title out in front of consumers are all pulled back. So what, what does that list look like? We do play something new every Friday where we highlight a board game and we teach a hundred or so people on Friday how to play. Those games live on our demo tables. Our staff knows how to sell those games. They get rotated once a month. They're highlighted in our marketing efforts, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We do different videos with them. Occasionally we run Twitch streams that end up being YouTube how to plays. We're moving into more of that space. So that's a big part of what we do to separate ourselves from the rest of the world when it comes to retail. When you do these things, I order less. I order less. I promote less. I the 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 amount of time that you have on my shelf goes down exponentially. I blow your stuff out faster. Thirty days without a sale and a new release becomes two weeks without a sale and a new release, and it's gone and it's discounted and it's lost. The expansion products from your core line get get looked at more heavily. They get blown out. I stop carrying some lines because it doesn't make sense. So let me let me get into this list. Number three is promos for purchase. I'm going to couple this with promos for purchase, website exclusives, and time exclusives. So if what you're doing is you're offering things that I can't offer in my retail store, things that I don't have a way to get a hold of, in an, in an effort to entice buying that's a problem for me. If you've included things that I'm not allowed to order and that are only available through your website as a way to entice sales, 
I have an issue with that. Now, if this is an accessory piece, if this is a, a, a play mat, if this is something that doesn't make sense to sell through distribution because you don't have the quantity that you need to produce in order to make that make sense, I get it. You still want to make those things. There's still a, there's still a, a an amount of players out there that'll want those products, or there's, you know, an opportunity where there's going to be enough Etsy sites that are going to make a ton of money off of your hard work, and you're trying to be a part of that money. I, I get that. If you have an opportunity where I can order those goods directly from you, at whatever margin you decide to sell them at, I'm cool with that. That that's fine. Give give me the opportunity then to offer those things to my customer. There's publishers out there that have convention exclusives that end up up, and there's some doodads and some widgets and things like that. Small stuff, no problem. The website exclusive stuff is is really tricky because you're offering a thing that's just non-existent in any catalog. I don't have the opportunity to sell. It's to me as difficult as it is to deal with a crowdfunding effort that's exclusive in that. If you 90% of your catalog goes through distribution or direct selling to the retailer and you've decided to do a crowdfunding effort and you can't build it in a way where the margin makes sense to do it and also sell some of that to retail, that's an issue. You shouldn't do that. I'm in a, I'm in a relationship with you where I'm carrying 90% of your product. When I can't get a hold of that product to sell to my customers, it, it makes me look less than in that case, and that sucks from an optics standpoint, with the largest game store in the country, why can't you get these metal coins or this play mat or this thing? That's frustrating. Timed exclusives is, is really bad. And what I mean by that is if you're offering a product on your website that's direct to consumer and it's a timed exclusive for 30 days, you're sucking so much money out of the ecosystem that by the time it gets to retail shelves, there's not as much left. The hype has died down. We have to work that much harder to try to sell that. That will make me change and adjust the way that I sell your products moving forward. Number two on the list is mass market exclusives. So I understand wanting to move to the big leagues. I understand working with a target buyer and a Barnes and Noble buyer is much easier than it is to working with 3,400, 3,800 of us here in the United States and the, at least that many in, in around the globe. The mass market push and pull, I, I, I get all of that. I, I, I know why you want to be on those shelves. I want you on those shelves in a lot of cases. If it's games that we're selling and you decide to put it in front of that space, if there's something that I can leverage, uh, collectible, expandable products where if a consumer has a good time with that thing and they look around, they source me out for those things. I, I don't have as much of an issue with that. But if I see something that's there that's built for mass market and it's never going to come through my retail doors, why? Why would you Why would you produce something that's just for mass that's never going to see my shelf? What is it about that? Have you Have you deemed that we've watered this game down so much that – it's going to be something that's palpable for mass market customers. No offense, mass market customers. We know you're just as smart as hobby customers. But we've made this product that we've decided is going to live on the mass market shelves where the, quote, non-gamer can actually be able to digest this thing because we think that this game is just too complicated. Well, have you put that game in front of what you would call a mass market customer and tried to figure out if you could teach it in time for them to actually digest the game? Because a lot of times, I think we discredit what we would call a mass market consumer, like they're just not as bright. Well, I promise you they're just as bright. They just want to have fun faster is the reality of it. Timed exclusives in the, in the mass market thing, that's great. It, it, you, know, you want to put something on the shelf and you want to do it for 60 days, you want to run it for 30 days and it's part of a promotion and it's this or that or the other thing. Yeah. I guess, do the thing, and then when you get the stuff pushed back off the Target shelves or off the Barnes & Noble shelves and it, there's retail to, to collect whatever that was afterwards and we take the secondary sales for that, cool. Except it causes all kinds of confusion. Customers come in because they've seen on your social media, they've seen on someplace else's social media, this game that exists and 
<laughs> they come in looking for it on my new release shelves because we have 20,000 unique board games on the shelf right now. Why don't you have this expansion or this two-player version of or this family, which is my favorite fa- family, version of whatever the game is? Well, because it's a Target or a Barnes & Noble exclusive or, a you know, God forbid it's an Amazon exclusive or something like that. It just creates a bunch of confusion for fans of yours and mine that just want to come into the store and buy it. But you do you. Number one, the number one most annoying thing that a publisher does, this is nuclear for me, is when the decision is made that you're going to increase the cost to me and you're not going to increase the cost of your MSRP. So somewhere in your business equation, what you've decided is shipping costs, domestic or foreign, production costs, petroleum costs, whatever has happened, based on your P&L on this product or this product line, an increase needs to occur. And the decision then is made that the sole person that's going to bear that increase in this entire equation is retail. Now, I'm not going to say for a minute that there aren't given that there isn't give and take that happens there. I'm not going to say that realistically to cover the cost of this new domestic shipping or this new international shipping or this new petroleum cost, there's not a portion of that that you're gobbling up to try to save us from that cost increase. Raise the MSRP. Just raise the MSRP. You have determined that there's going to be some cost increases. No problem. Raise the MSRP in a way that meets that so that the burden is shared on everybody through the chain. Don't put the burden on me or don't make it look like you're just putting the burden on me because I can adjust the MSRP, but when I adjust the MSRP or I adjust my price above your MSRP, then there's all kinds of confusion too. Well, why are you selling this for $57.99? And I get the ugliness of the psychology of those numbers, although I have plenty of board games on my shelf that are from different countries that have some really weird MSRPs because the conversion from euro to US dollar is a little bit different and it doesn't look the same. So when it comes to those sort of things, I get you got to increase costs. No problem. All of our costs have gone up. My costs have gone up. My costs have gone up exponentially. The move was a big part of that, but also just the stuff, general life stuff. We, we pay for shipping from distribution more now than we used to. The, the other things to run a business, when you increase those costs, all of that additional fluff stuff that we use to try to separate ourselves from other brick and mortar stores and the different things that we're allowed to do and bonuses for my employees and advertisement for your products and events that we run and all those things, that comes from inside of that cost analysis. So if we're not getting normal margin on that thing, what is the reason why? And if you've decided to increase, what is the reason why you haven't increased MSRP too? Is it just fear? Well, if the customer market says they don't want to buy it at that price, but you're asking me to absorb that cost, it's pretty awful. So please don't do that because it will change my relationship with your business in perpetuity. Honorable mention for this is exceptionally long item codes, <laughs> if you're making item codes and they're exceptionally long and it's really difficult to put into our point of sale and it's a pain in the butt and the people that handle my receiving have to do that, then, you know, that's a, that's a terrible thing and a terrible issue to deal with. What we're going to do next week is next week, we're going to talk about how to get the most out of conventions or trade shows on the retail side of things, how to approach them in a professional way to, Find the best value for traveling out to a trade show or a convention and how you can make those things work for your business. Again, thanks, everybody. Please feel free to click the like, comment. That's all great. And we'll go to talking after this.